Okay, so welcome everyone and um, thank you for coming to this technical review on the water treatment processes in the Camarones project. The program is partially funded by Piper Servant Leadership Fund at the COE at UW-Madison and the Mortgage Center for Public Service. So that's the Wisconsin Idea Fellowship and why we're here tonight. Um, my name is Anna Digest. Oops. And I am a current project manager in the Ecuador branch of UWB UW Madison. And my name is Alex Yos, and I'm a current program manager uh, for the Ecuador chapter in uh, EWB. And uh, I'm a junior here at UW studying uh, chemical engineering and chemistry right now. So, uh, so the next. Before before we jump into um, our agenda, I just wanted to briefly give a short uh, land acknowledgement. So tonight we recognize that the University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk Nation, who have called this land Tijope since time immemorial. We acknowledge the circumstances that led to the forced removal of the Ho-Chunk people and honor their history of resistance and resilience. The Ho-Chunk Nation and the other 11 First Nations residing in the boundaries of present-day Wisconsin remain vibrant and strong. We recognize and respect the inherent sovereignty of the 12 First Nations that reside in these boundaries of the state of Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs this fellowship's coursework and hopes for a shared future. Okay, so here is a little agenda of what we will be going over today. Um, so first, we're gonna give you a little background on uh, the project that we are working on, the Camarones Water Project uh, through EWB, Engineers Without Borders. And uh, after that, we are gonna dive in more to the water treatment processes that we looked at uh, for this particular project. Uh, and then we will talk about what uh, strategies we chose and what strategies we chose uh, not to use in our project. And then uh, finally, we will get to why we didn't use certain processes and uh, what we may be able to use in the future uh, with the Camarones Water Project, uh, additionally to what we are planning to implement um, in the near future. Okay, so as promised, we will begin with a little uh, project background. So the Camarones Water Project was begun in 2017 after the neighboring town of Tabuga finished uh, a successful implementation of another EWB water project. Um, so the town of Camarones itself is right off of a coastal highway um, on, in Ecuador, located kind of in a rural area, a couple kilometers inland and is just a couple kilometers away from the equator itself. So fun fact, um, the Camarones population is between 450 and 500 inhabitants, depending on the season. So something important to note about this community is that it is subdivided into three main neighborhoods. So that's Bajo, Medio and Alto, which have um, significant geographical distances between a couple other um, points of interest in this map include the water treatment and storage location and the river well. The river well is located at an altitude somewhere in between that treatment and storage area and Alto. And the treatment and storage area is the highest elevation point that we will be looking at today, just for reference. So in this town, um, there's a Camarones River that runs along the main road and crosses over this main road a couple times. Um, and this will be the source of our uh, water for the project. So most people in town are dedicated to the agricultural or tourism sectors. A lot of um, People are fishermen in town or uh, daily and seasonal laborers that sort of leave Camarones during the day and come back. Um, and uh, people are extremely hardworking and resilient in Camarones, which 
kind of brought these people out of a devastating earthquake in 2016. So one of the main challenges that Camarones faced even before this earthquake was access to reliable, clean sources of water. Currently, the way that um, Camarones people obtain their drinking water is either directly from the river or by means of um, bottled water that you can see in the top right. So that's uh, trucks that come into town every two weeks or so into Camarones. They drive in and you can refill your jugs or buy new ones. So um, this is an issue because during the rainy season, this, um, this main road in town is interrupted periodically by uh, the, the Camarones River. So the little gaps that you see in this elevation data, those are river crossings that the uh, trucks and the cars and you know motorcycles have to cross over in order to get to different parts of town. And there's even a main crossing at the entrance of the Camarones Road that prevents the entrance of um, these trucks during the rainy season for weeks at a time. So people are either forced to purchase large amounts of um, jugs before this rainy season or simply drink river water, which uh, we will see later has some issues as well. So this is just a little comparison picture of, um, it's the same location along the Camarones River, just so we can see the difference in flow uh, that the river experiences seasonally from the wet to the dry season. And to the left is one of the bacteria samples that we obtained and um, cultured from one of our trips in 2018. We usually test for E. coli and um, anaerobic bacteria, um, which are you know, fairly good indicators that this water is likely unsafe to drink um, as raw water uh, directly from the river. So people are aware of this in town. So if they are forced to drink river water, they do boil it beforehand and um, you know, induce some treatment into the water, or they will use these um, ceramic filters that were donated post, uh, post earthquake in 2016. Um, of course, the life, the shelf life of those is um, not super long. And then um, there's also the chances of you know, cross-contamination uh, during this boiling process or, you know, use of um, contaminated vessels that might um, prevent this boiling from completely eliminating the pathogens in the water. So the Camarones project uh, has been in the works since uh, 2017. And since then, we have completed three in-person assessment trips uh, down in Ecuador, and we also performed an alternatives analysis to uh, determine the best overall design for our project to serve our community. And uh, we are currently working on the revisions of our pre-implementation document, and uh, this will be submitted to Engineers Without Borders and uh, hopefully approved so we can possibly travel uh, this summer and implement our trip. Um, due to COVID-19, we most likely will not be able to travel to implement um, our project uh, this summer. And we actually were planning on an implementation last uh, summer as well, which we were not able to do. So this has pushed back uh, our project's timeline a little bit. So. Uh, we are planning on our first implementation trip to be completed uh, remotely uh, this summer in August, and then hopefully we'll be able to complete uh, the next two implementation trips shortly after. And our final goal is for completed construction to be uh, done in 2022. Um, I think that's, yeah, so here are the four design alternatives that we looked at uh, when we completed our alternatives analysis, and I will 
kind of run through what these four diagrams mean real quick. Um, the four ideas that we looked over. <clears throat> um, so first, river pump with full distribution. This uh, would have been the ideal um, alternative. This would have been a system that uh, had a, a electric working pump that could distribute water to uh, a tap in everybody's household. So that's what we mean by full distribution. Um, honestly, similar to what most of us probably have here, or direct access in your home. Uh, the next alternative, uh, river pump uh, with central distribution. Uh, this is uh, this is the pump pumping water up to uh, treatment tanks that are slightly above an elevation, as Anna mentioned earlier on uh, that map that she showed. And then from there, uh, the water will actually be kind of gra more gravity fed down to central distribution uh, stations. And then gravity fed uh, central distribution, this would just be without the pump pumping up to the treatment locations. Um, and then finally, uh, river well central distribution would have been us uh, drilling uh, a river well uh, in hopes to access a water source or a clean water source that um, we could then uh, send through a piping network to uh, central distribution locations. So here is the design matrix that we created um, for these four alternatives. Uh, we completed this with the help of our mentors uh, over at um, or 3WB and MAPC, uh, the Madison Area Professional Chapter. And basically the uh, kind of selected or winning alternative, alternative was the uh, river pump with central distribution option. Uh, this was mainly uh, due towards the ability of the community to access uh, the clean water at uh, three main locations. Um, as Anna showed, uh, Alto, Medio and Bajo are the three uh, kind of sections of Camarones and uh, the river pump allows us to pump water up to these treatment uh, storage tanks, uh, treatment and storage tanks that are pre-existing and already there. So we're able to make use of some materials, some very large tanks that we can use for uh, to perform water treatment um, strategies on. Um, so that was the main reason we chose with the river pump option. Uh, the, the first option of full distribution uh, that financially would have been much tougher uh, for us. So that was probably the ideal option, but um, not quite uh, logistically possible for our project. So as Alex just touched on before, um, there are several elements of existing infrastructure that we will be kind of recycling into our project. So that includes two large concrete cisterns, um, which is that tank's location that we were discussing before. Uh, you can see in the picture, there's a treatment compound as well in between these two. And uh, we plan to bypass that. It contains a basin that you can see in the bottom left with some baffles in the middle and a couple empty carbon, uh, activated carbon and sand filters. And then we will be using the larger cistern for sedimentation and the second smaller cistern for clean water storage. We also originally planned on using a well that was constructed around the same time as those tanks. So all structures around 2012, I believe. Um, but we had, uh, we, we got word from our community members a few months ago that this uh, well structure was washed away um, during some heavy rainfall events. So um, definitely taking more seriously those um, heavy currents that we saw in previous pictures. So we can imagine the strength of those. And, you know, this well was in place for over 10 years and um, was taken down. So even though this um, signified, you know, some design changes to the infrastructure of the project source, it wasn't significant enough to change our decided alternative that we just mentioned here. There is also a main pipeline 
varied all the way from the uh, source location to the tanks and from the tanks to alto and to medio. The issue with all of these um, existing structures, however, is that these were implemented um, or I guess constructed before this earthquake in 2016. So the structural integrity might be compromised. And so we're working closely with the in-country office right now um, to kind of conduct a mini assessment um, of these uh, infrastructure elements that we may uh, employ in the future. Oh, Tabitha's trying to join. Uh, so the town also received a pump that is three phase, uh, five horsepower which is much more power than we require currently for our design. Um, and it is also not able to work in town because uh, Camarones only receives one phase electricity. So we're hoping to hope, you know, sell or trade the pump for something that better fits our needs. And to um, remediate some of those river crossing issues with the distribution line, we hope to implement three suspended crossings that will um, connect this piping over on top of those uh, ravines. So hopefully avoiding those like strong washout currents that we're trying to avoid. And uh, this distribution line will culminate in three large central distribution centers. So one in each of the three neighborhoods. And this picture is taken from a central distribution location in the town of Tabuga, neighboring Camarones again. And the model of this system is that um, inhabitants will go and purchase their refills or new jugs and those, um, those funds are used to, um, to pay for maintenance costs and even a small salary for the station assistant if the water committee deems it necessary or um, helpful. So we're also working with the committee on establishing some of those operations. Um, but as you can see, there's a recurring theme of different NGOs, um, kind of coming to Camarones and starting projects and sort of letting them go. Uh, so we hope to finally close that loop and bring a sustainable um, water system that is reliable to the people in Camarones. So before we dive into some of these individually, we just wanted to show you guys uh, an overview of the Camarones water process as a whole. So as you can see, we will be sourcing water from the Camarones River and uh, we will be pumping that water up to the kind of treatment compound on a, and I uh, mentioned before those uh, tanks and cisterns. And then we'll be performing sedimentation uh, in those tanks. And then we will be chlorinating the water for disinfection. Uh, that water will be going to uh, a tank that will be used for storage. And then from there, uh, water will be uh, distributed through our piping network to uh, the three uh, source locations in Alto, Medio, and Bajo. So now we're going to uh, get more into the specifics of the unit processes of treatment that we chose uh, for the Camarones project. So before we talk just right now about those unit processes, um, I would like to first describe a few uh, preventive treatment, treatment strategies that the team took on in order to look at treatment in a more holistic way. So most of these involve avoiding turbidity. As you saw in previous pictures, um, water can get pretty murky when it is the rainy season. So that's a lot of suspended solids, dissolved solids, um, organic matter that we need to avoid. Um, whereas in the dry season, water tends to be pretty clear and we don't foresee that being a big issue. 
but we have to account for that variability. So what we do is look first at source location. We chose this sort of dammed um, portion of the river for uh, to form sort of a basin where water would have some time to settle, hopefully after running through the rest of its course beforehand. So um, drawing water from that location, we think might be a more stable um, source for our pump. And then pump placement. So very important, uh, locating the suctioning portion outside of that sediment zone in the river is key. Uh, so we're going to be placing the pump on an angle and horizontally. And we'll look at that in the next slide. And then, of course, looking at watershed protection measures. Uh, fortunately, the Seva Foundation, our NGO, and other surrounding NGOs in the area are working towards amazing um, reforestation and um, agroforestry programs that would hopefully prevent some of this um, soil loss and runoff into our river that could potentially add to that turbidity. And then finally, the team took some time to really understand the local conditions of weather and um, other you know, stressors that might uh, cause fluctuations in water quality. So um, it was key to partner with the local municipality and our partner NGO and obtain some of those hydrological studies um, water quality data from previous years to really hunker down on um, what our river looks like when we are not there to see what it looks like the rest of the year. So uh, like I mentioned before, this is kind of a drawing for our pump um, surrounded in red. It's going to be latched onto the rock wall that you saw in the previous picture. So. If you have the, um, the well that is turned over on its side in the middle of the picture, we are choosing the wall to the left of that um, to attach this pump and hopefully lead pipe up towards the dammed um, uh, portion and then up to the tanks afterwards. So another reason for um, implementing this pump on an angle um, for a couple of reasons, is to minimize some of that perpendicular water current that could damage or stress the system. We think it might help with long-term maintenance. And um, just, just improve or facilitate pump um, removal, so just for maintenance issues and stuff. And also um, because the pool that we've chosen is not deep enough uh, to provide that extra clearance that a vertically installed pump would need below its point of suction uh, to allow for that process to work smoothly. So the first um, official unit process that we will be talking about that we've chosen is sedimentation. So once uh, the water comes up from the pump, it'll enter the sedimentation raw water tank where it'll first see a manifold diffuser, which um, will act to uh, slow incoming flow and make uh, more laminar flow um, out of this incoming water. And the reason for this is to uh, reduce, or I guess increase settling velocity for particles. Uh, as you can see in the top right graph, it's a little small, but uh, turbulent flow will provide a slower settling velocity for a lot of particles. So uh, we hope to kind of steady that um, incoming water in order to help particles settle out. And thanks to the piping team, which did a few of these uh, settling calculations, we found that most particles around the diameter of 0.01 millimeter um, will be able to settle within a few feet of entering this tank. And as you can see, um, it's, it's a much larger tank than a few feet. So um, hopefully there's enough time and space 
to allow for settlement of a wide range of particles uh, once it enters. And this is just a little diagram of the horizontal flow sedimentation uh, for this raw water system. So hopefully implementing a manifold diffuser in the blue box on the diagram and um, helping uh, produce that laminar flow. One of the main, some of the main reasons that we selected um, sedimentation as one of the bigger unit processes is just due to its cost efficiency. Um, it's passive, it's a passive process actually. And um, we have a large area available in this tank. It's a massive concrete tank um, and we have time. So we're gonna be, you know, those are, um, important resources. And um, like I mentioned before, there's a wide range of particles that this works for. And that's uh, a really positive thing to hear for when you have um, really turbid conditions like we do in a few months of the year. And then another um, treatment uh, unit process that we're going to be employing is simple chlorination or disinfection. And the way that chlorine um, kills these pathogens in the water is simply by oxidizing some of the uh, bonds in the molecules on these pathogens. So inoculating or killing um, bacteria and other um, small living things um, is the main goal of this unit process. And you can accomplish that by, <clears throat> excuse me, adding uh, substances like hypochlorous acid or hypochlorite at really small doses and with high effect effective um, removal numbers. So um, the wide range also of um, pathogens that this uh, unit process is able to target is also a good reason why we chose uh, this particular process, as well as it's, um, it's relatively cheap, the chlorine products that we're going to choose. Oh, I think there was a slide that was moved. Oh, was there? Yeah. Was flocculation before this? Because I can just I might um, try that now. No, it was a. Uh, sorry. After chlorination, we were going to present the. Um, dismissed oh. unit processes. Okay. So I guess we'll just introduce it now. Um, we were we're going to be talking about the unit processes that uh, we deemed um, for further consideration. Yep. So uh, the first one we're going to talk about is a process called coagulation. Um, this is a it becoming increasingly more common in water treatment uh, in modern day uh, practices, but uh, by definition, coagulation is a uh, chemical process used to neutralize charges of small particles and form a mass through adsorption large enough to settle or be trapped in a process filter. So uh, basically, to put in simple terms, uh, what happens in coagulation is uh, these added chemicals react uh, with particles in the water and these uh, particles form larger masses and then these larger masses are able to be more easily separated from the, wa uh, from the water uh, or filtered out. So uh, this, is, this is why iron and aluminum are um, very effective uh, coagulants and it's from their ability to form these larger uh, compounds, these uh, polynuclear complexes so the most common coagulants uh, you'll see are um, PAC, polyaluminum chloride, and then uh, aluminum sulfates, uh, iron sulfates, iron chloride, and then uh, potassium permanganate is also fairly common. So uh, next we get to flocculation, which is very closely related uh, to coagulation, uh, which is why we kind of are going to talk about both at the same time here. Uh, when P 
people talk about uh, flocculation, they mainly talk about forming those larger flocks in a very similar way as uh, coagulants do. Um, it is called flocculation literally because these flocks uh, form and then usually uh, can settle out uh, of the water, similar to a uh, sedimentation process, uh, but it is from an added chemical that uh, is able to react um, with the particles uh, that are uh, water soluble. So, I'm gonna go to the next slide, Anna. So there's, uh, th there's pros and cons to uh, these processes and they, mo they, they, most, uh, they most closely have to relate to the ability to administer these chemicals properly. Uh, coagulation and flocculation, like I said, is becoming increasingly more popular because it is very effective and uh, it can uh, really specify uh, many pathogen and uh, actually uh, suspended solid problems. Um, and if Im implemented well, can be very effective, but uh, it would be an added materials cost to our project and an added maintenance uh, cost and basically responsibility for the community. Um, you need a supply of the coagulant that you're using and it would need to be consistent. Uh, basically with our project, uh, in Camarones, due to the water data that we've collected, which is actually uh, very good and pretty low in uh, total suspended solids, and uh, disinfection will be the most important part of our process. Uh, we 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 did decide, or we have decided, to uh, dismiss these techniques for now. Um, I guess that's yep. That's all I got up there. Uh, so, so that's where the slide went. Oh, gotcha. And then uh, lastly, uh, simple filtration was um, talked about uh, within our group uh, a lot with our uh, water treatment. Uh, many of you probably know uh, this is really just sending uh, your raw water through some type of porous membrane and then uh, blocking uh, larger uh, particles uh, that can't get through the membrane, just filtering water, uh, pretty, pretty much like that. Um, these membranes can be made of a lot of things, like like I said, a filter, or you can make uh, like sand membranes and stuff. But basically, um, what I was saying is uh, our total suspended solid uh, data that we have on our water is fairly low, and uh, due to those uh, the size of those sedimentation tanks, which are which are fairly big. Um, we, we believe that sedimentation will be able to handle um, most of the suspended solids and that filtration uh, wouldn't, wouldn't quite be necessary for our water due to the, the good uh, data that we have on it. And uh, again, it would be uh, an added maintenance responsibility for the community and possibly more maintenance costs. Uh, you have to replace or refill membranes um, regularly or after a lot of use. And uh, again, we, we don't wanna uh, put in uh, added components to our process that simply aren't needed. So that's why we dismissed uh, a filtration or a filter apparatus for our process. And so now uh, we get to kind of future uh, considerations for our current project design. Um, first, we will talk about really the, the big question mark um, with our with the data that we have on the, the water that we'll be using in the Camerones River, and that actually was uh, vanadium. When we got our samples back, like I said, all of uh, the nitrates level levels were low, um, all of the metals and uh, uh, main main water data were under the uh, health regulations uh, already besides vanadium. Uh, vanadium was slightly above kind of uh, the Wisconsin State Laboratory's uh, recommended standards. And uh, it took a lot of investigating into what we can possibly do for this problem. It's actually pretty unusual. And uh, basically due to the uncertainty 
and health effects of uh, vanadium. We, we weren't able to figure out a process within our budget that uh, would have properly removed uh, vanadium from their water. And this is mostly due to uh, these pieces of machinery just being pretty expensive as uh, you can see on here. Uh, ion, ion exchange, uh, ion exchanges, uh, this, this could have worked probably with uh, vanadium figuring out another compound that uh, would be able to react with it and pull it out of the water. Um, somewhat similar to coagulation, but not really. Again, just very expensive. Uh, reverse osmosis um, apparatuses work very well and may have, may have, may not have uh, helped us here with vanadium. Um, our, our, actually, our previous Tabuga water project in Ecuador um, use, uses a reverse osmo, osmosis apparatus, but we were not able to get one. And then the following um, processes, again, are just fairly expensive and uh, not financially realistic for our process. But in the future, as we monitor um, these, the water data, once we put the, uh, our project in and implement um, all of the processes, this definitely could be something that once we get a little more funding that we look into more possibly, you know, trying some reverse osmosis or um, doing a little more research on how we can solve this vanadium problem because it is it is a concern um, just as a, a general perspective like hard hard metals like this in water are fairly toxic uh, for humans at, at high high doses so like I mentioned it was uh, we are not looking at a very high concentration or anything of vanadium but this is an interesting problem that um, we definitely will have to monitor for the future and um, hopefully we can um, attempt to solve once we get this this project up and up and running. So then we go back to um, coagulation and flocculation. Uh, like I said, we did dismiss this um, for the Camarones water project for now. Um, we just don't think it's necessary and uh, would require more maintenance from the community. But um, again, like I said, this possibly could be used to help with the vanadium problem or even uh, problems with the sedimentation if the, our sedimentation basin isn't quite uh, performing well enough for the community's needs. This could be another added process um, of just the coagulation and then flocculation settling um, for solids and metals and things. But uh, definitely something we will uh, consider for the future as we monitor um, this project. Great. So um, we've arrived sort of at the conclusion of our presentation today, and we will go through a very, very brief review before opening it up to questions. So we had a chance to look at sedimentation, simple filtration, simple chlorination, hard metal removal, um, a combination of coagulation and flocculation. And we've uh, sort of selected sedimentation and simple chlorination for sure and left the rest kind of up for future consideration based on monitoring um, community capacities and sort of unfortunately budget. So for different reasons, um, we have constraints. And I'd like to take a moment here, well, Alex and I would like to take a moment here to thank everyone um, here that uh, attended as well as all of the subgroups and the amazing work that they do every day. Um, it wouldn't be possible without their persistence um, and their leads as well. And you know, they do a lot of the grunt work that make these um, projects possible. And mentors and present and professors both helping out with those grunt work calculations. And of course the SABA Foundation for um, sharing all of their um, water quality data with us that's so much shaped what our treatment looks like now.